love it. This is awesome. I'm, we're going to need an intro like this for all my future talks, so you're not going to get friends very soon. Um, thank you so much, uh, Heather and all of the entire team, for, for bringing us all together um, as this community. It's such a treat to be here. I, as Heather knows, I've been looking forward to this for a long, long time. So, so thanks for having us, and, and thanks for having me. I'll jump straight uh, to it. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. And ceci n'est pas un drone, at least not the picture that comes to mind, I don't think, when we, when we hear the word drone on television, right? We tend to think about flying, killing robots that cost a million dollars a piece. Well, this quadcopter for propellers was actually made in Ghana last month from recycled material, from spare parts, from, you see the styrofoam there, and lots and lots of rubber bands. This is what I saw a couple days ago at the airport in Singapore in the duty-free shop of an international airport. You can start buying these quadcopters and drones. So they're really becoming more and more mainstream. So from, from Ghana to Singapore, all the way to Guyana even, in the rainforests of Guyana, the beautiful forests of Guyana, that are unfortunately under threat from illegal deforestation and mining and so on. So a local indigenous community, the Wapichanas, have basically built their own drone from, from, basic, from scratch with a little help from our friends at Digital Democracy. And one of the stories that I like the most about this indigenous tribe community working on this, putting this drone together, is at one point, the mount for their motor broke. And so the Wapichanas basically scoured their village looking for anything that they could use to fix that particular mount. And they ended up finding an, a piece of an old beer crate, which they used to fashion a new mount. And I, I love this story because that's the point at which this technology is no longer a foreign, mysterious, external technology. It's a technology that the, the Wapichanas can own, can mold, can hack, can craft, and really understand. And like all of us in this new drones for good Mark, space, you know, we, we learn by doing. Um, that's the only way I think you, you do can often with innovation. And it doesn't always go the way we plan, right? But if at first you, you fail, then you know, try, try, and try again. That is the nature of a lot of the innovation that all of us, all of you do every day. So from, from Ghana to Singapore to Guyana to the beautiful Arabian Gulf, the beautiful colors of the turquoise Arabian Sea, where you have these wonderful uh, sea mammals called dugongs. So if you're not familiar with dugongs, here's a dugong. Um, that's what it looks like in, in the Arabian Gulf. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the dugong population off the coast of Qatar and the UAE is a very special uh, population for marine biologists because that particular dugong population is very distinct from the others that scientists have studied around the world. But the last time that a survey was done on this specific population was 1985, so literally 30 years ago. So I thought to myself, I do quite a bit of work uh, out of Doha, this is a picture um, from the office, and there's a very active DIY drones for good community in Doha. So I figured maybe we could help out. We could help these, these scientists survey um, this incredibly incredible uh, animal. So the marine biologists were game. The, the, the professors at the local university were game. So they give us this map. The red rectangle is where they think usually dugongs can be spotted, especially during the colder uh, season. So we figured, you know what, let's just do a trial. Uh, we identified a couple potential takeoff and, and landing sites, and we decided, you know, we'll try it out. And we, we took this uh, little fixed wing UAV and uh, found a landing slash takeoff uh, place. And just like the Wapitana in Guyana, it took a few tries to, to get it right. I won't tell you how many, because it would take a long time uh, if I showed you everything. But sure enough, after breaking the two propellers, we finally got um, the UAV, the drone up in the air, which was a manual takeoff. But then as soon as it gets to a certain height, you can just flip it on automatic, and it flies itself. They really are flying robots, autonomous flying robots. And it, it can get actually a little boring, and it was getting quite hot, and it was not even noon yet, so we rushed back to the car. And you'll see the screen here on the, on the left, it's a basically a directional antenna, 
which is, allows us to uh, see what the UAV is seeing. This see is a forward-facing camera. Nice. So I'm not sure if the Perfect. colors are really rendering here, but it's a beautiful blue. And you see the different patches of coral and sand and seagrass and so on. And we also have a downward-facing camera. That's taking the, the pictures, hopefully, of the, of the dugong. So that's what it was all about. And a lot of waiting in the car. It felt like a bit of like a stakeout at a sort of police um, sting operation. So we felt quite badass at, at after a while. Um, but uh, it does get old pretty quickly. That's all you, you see. But just to share, to share with you that this is the exact same kind of technology that Haitians are using out of Port-au-Prince. They, oh, for years now, in fact, after Hurricane Sandy, we associate Hurricane Sandy with New York almost exclusively. But Hurricane Sandy went straight through Haiti. And this team of local Haitians used very similar UAV technology to identify areas that were flooded, destroyed, and also areas of standing water, because that's a real problem in terms of mosquitoes and so on. So the UAV finally came back half an hour later. It automatically circles overhead, and then we take over the controls, and you basically land it manually, which we did. Then we rushed to the, to the drone, quickly took the SD card out with all the pictures, very excited, ran back to the car to look at the pictures. And this was not one of the pictures, right? Um, we were obviously at 100 or 200 feet. But this, the, this is what we were looking for, in, in a way. And this is another picture of a dugong from, from a boat, which we can't really use, or the scientists don't really want to use, because they actually do injure dugongs, and they scare them away. So it kind of defeats the purpose. You're annoying the, the marine life, and you're potentially putting them in danger. But dugongs are kind of massive, as you probably can tell. And in the very shallow waters off the coast of Qatar, where you're talking about three or four, five meters depth maximum, they really stand out, which was the whole point of our operation. This is one of the hundred or so aerial images that we captured just for as a proof of concept. And you can really tell where the sand is, where the, the coral, or where the seagrass and, and seaweed is. So this is something that the scientists and marine biologists now in Doha are very excited about, which we're going to then ramp up um, when it gets a little colder and the dugongs um, come back. Now let's move to another place and on land in uh, Namibia, where some friends of mine partnered with a uh, wildlife reserve. They together flew a bunch of UAVs. You see them right here. They weigh about 600, 700 grams, so they're not your predator drones, right? Um, and also fly autonomously. And the reason that the rangers in Namibia wanted to get this aerial imagery is because they wanted to improve their wildlife monitoring and protection efforts. You, you can't protect what you don't know you, you don't have, right? So they wanted to get a sense of what is in their uh, natural reserve and, and how to best protect it. This is not uh, just a video of, a, of this UAV landing. This is fully autonomous landing. Uh, landed, nobody at the controls here. And you can see it's, it's very soft. It's, uh, again, 600, 700 grams. It's nearly impossible to hurt anyone. In fact, people have tried and shown on YouTube that they have failed to hurt each other with, with this UAV. So these are the friendly kind. And what the Rangers at the end of the day then uh, were left with were tens of th thousands of very high resolution aerial imagery of their wildlife reserve. And it would have taken them months. This is what they told us. You know, they, here they were with a bunch of images. And they need to be out in the bush protecting the animals. They shouldn't be behind a computer pouring over a bunch of images. So we decided to try something different. My team and I at QCRI have been uh, developing this prototype experimental platform called Micromappers, which is free and open source. And the purpose of Micromappers is really for humanitarian response, which is why it's a joint initiative with the United Nations. And Micromappers combines crowdsourcing with artificial intelligence to make sense of big data, so-called big data, tweets, text messages, pictures on Instagram, YouTube videos, uh, satellite imagery, and aerial imagery. So we figured, OK, we've got this platform that works and that we're developing for disaster response. Why not apply it to uh, wildlife conservation? And so we did. The rangers were really up for it. We took all 20,000 plus aerial images, pushed it to micromappers, and invited the crowds to be a part of the solution. And the crowd went wild. They loved this, Every, you know, from, from middle schoolers in Austin, Texas, to retired professionals in Bangkok, Thailand, and everything in between. People loved the idea of helping rangers in Namibia by flying over uh, the, this beautiful landscape and looking for these uh, beautiful animals. These are rhinos, which are highly endangered. And there's a huge poaching issue of rhinos and elephants across uh, southern Africa. So that's what we did. And we figured, OK, wow. Um, 
they, the crowd basically finished in, in less than 24 hours. So you, here you had the Rangers saying it was going to take them months, and the crowd loved it and finished in 24 hours. In fact, they complained after 24 hours were up, and there were no more pictures to, to tag. We thought it was going to take them a few days. People were really cross and not happy. So um, note to self, get more, get more pictures. We got some great uh, media coverage from CNN and, and others, which really helped uh, our volunteers feel validated and that they were doing something really that was being recognized by the international media. Then what we did is we took those traces and we worked with some graduate students in, in Switzerland who study computer vision. We took all these traces, and this is where the artificial intelligence comes in. We taught the algorithm, we taught Ader how to recognize this wildlife uh, automatically, so automated feature detection. And I'm very proud to announce that we can now automatically detect gazelles in uh, aerial images, which is not particularly helpful for disaster response, but it's a step forward. And it's a, it, conceptually, it's a great proof of concept in terms of what's possible. And the team is going back next month to Namibia to do more flights. So we're going to get more data and try more things. And one of the quotes I really liked from, from one of the rangers, they were all really impressed, but the rangers themselves had overlooked animals in some of the pictures that the crowd had looked at. So the crowd was able to identify animals. Um, a seventh grader in Austin, Texas, was able to spot a rhino where a, a ranger who's been doing this for a decade wasn't even able to see it. So this was a great win for the crowd. So I want to end with uh, something that's a little closer to what I've been doing over the past few years is, is humanitarian response. I, I had the uh, privilege of spearheading the World Bank's uh, UAV response to Cyclone Pam, which was a high-end Category 5 cyclone that devastated the islands of Vanuatu in the Pacific. If you're not familiar where Vanuatu is, I had to look it up as well when I was asked to do this. Uh, it's like three hours north of New Zealand. Um, beautiful set of islands, amazing people. And uh, the devastation was what you would expect after a, a Category 5 uh, cyclone, really um, extensive. And you had huge trees like this one that just you know, snapped over just like if they were toothpicks. Now, pictures on the ground and ground-based surveys can, can give you a lot of information, but I don't know what's past this particular debris. I don't know what's on the other side of that house. Is it destroyed or not? So what the World Bank ended up doing, and the reason I got involved, was they activated the Humanitarian UAV Network, which is a, a network I founded uh, a year or two ago. And what this network does is it basically has access to 700 professional vetted uh, UAV pilots in about 60 different countries around the world. And we basically match these pilots with humanitarian organizations around the world. And this is exactly what happened. The World Bank I, uh, basically recruited, contracted two pilots, two UAV teams, rather, from our roster of pilots to carry out this uh, two-week mission on the ground, which was incredibly challenging. This was a couple of weeks ago. I just got back myself. Uh, the New Zealand team that was getting ready to uh, calibrate their, their UAVs. A little closer, you see this is a hexacopter. It's got six helicopters. And by the way, the, the World Health Organization, Doc, Médecins Sans Frontières, and I've been also talking to um, uh, Last Mile Health in Liberia, are all experimenting with these kinds of multi-rotor UAVs for payload transportation of medication, blood samples, vaccines, and so on. This is not hypothetical. It's already been happening. The World Health Organization has been doing this in Bhutan, Doctors Without Borders in uh, Papua New Guinea, and I mentioned Last Mile Health in Liberia. So this is just to give you an example of what a rotary wing UAV looks like compared to what you've seen from the fixed wing. We were just calibrating this uh, manually, but after that, it flies itself. Automatic takeoff, automatic landing, and so on. So this is an image that I took with, with one of my UAVs just for demo purposes. What we then did uh, on behalf of the World Bank, because they wanted these images in order to assess disaster damage, right? to get a, 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 an aerial bird's eye view of the, of the damage. We sliced up the images into micro images and then pushed that to micro mappers and invited the crowd just like they had done with the wildlife in Namibia, to trace houses that were completely destroyed or partially destroyed or, or largely intact. And the result was you know, quite impressive because within a matter of a few days, more than 2,500 very high resolution aerial images were analyzed by digital humanitarians from dozens and dozens of countries, in fact, close to 40 different countries around the world. Nothing like this has been done before. Crowdsourcing aerial imagery from UAVs was completely new, and this is just a few weeks old. So you're some of the very first to, to learn about this. So if you go to micromappers.org, you can look at the map yourself. You'll uh, click on the marker. You'll see the traces. The blue traces re uh, refer to 
the houses that have been intact, and then the orange is partially destroyed and the red fully destroyed. Now, these are really high-resolution aerial images. So this is how close you can get. You're getting four centimeter resolution. A satellite image will not give you this. And in fact, also a satellite image will only give you a bird's eye view, which can hide a lot of the damage. We were taking these pictures at an angle. So what are we doing next? We're working with these same computer vision graduate students to automate this, to teach the algorithm how to recognize what damaged and non-damaged houses look like during disaster so we can semi-automate and eventually potentially fully automate disaster damage uh, detection in future disasters. But even with an aerial image, you're, I don't know what's on the other side of this, of this house. Could it be fully damaged? Could it be flooded? Who knows? You're, you're still stuck. So the real solution moving forward is going to be 3D, where you have to jump. In fact, we have to jump directly to three dimensions. This um, 3D uh, point cloud, as they're called, is generated simply from the two-dimensional aerial images that I, that I showed you earlier. So simply from two-dimensional images, you can use software that's been around for a few years now to create a full-fledged 3D model. And that is a kind of insight that humanitarians need to be able to look at 360 angle uh, to determine how much damage there is. This is from one of the villages in Vanuatu that the government had asked us to, to prioritize. So this is where we're going to head towards. Uh, very soon, and what uh, my colleagues and I are working on now is pushing these 3D models directly to micromappers to crowdsource the analysis of 3D imagery to identify disaster damage. So you could have volunteers on their iPads, this is like augmented reality or virtual reality, right? Inspecting a house that's 5,000 miles away in the middle of the Pacific, and then annotating, literally with just a finger, saying, okay, there's damage here, there's damage there. And you might have guessed the next step is we want to automate that. We want to use artificial intelligence to do 3D feature detection uh, of damage, which, as far as we know, has not really been attempted yet. But I think there's been some in interesting breakthroughs in computer vision over the past uh, 16 to 20 months. And we want to bring that and mainstream that and fast track that right into humanitarian space. Now, it's all fine and well to talk about these fancy technologies and you know, flying robots, artificial intelligence, and so on. But at the end of the day, the re main reason I wrote my book on digital humanitarians is because it's a human story for me, first and foremost. Nobody would be looking at these pictures if they didn't care. And this is a map of where all the volunteers, the hundreds of volunteers who participated in response to the Vanuatu cyclone were based. There are about 37, 38 pict um, countries in, in a, across six continents. So there's an incredible amount of digital goodwill out there that people want to be a part of the solution. And if you provide them with an appropriate, responsible interface, they can really have operational impact. They can really help others in need while they're back home in their office or commuting to work. It's a whole different world that we haven't been able to do before. We used to have to be geographically there in order to help. Now operationally, we can do that with a click of the mouse. So if you can, if you can click like on a Facebook picture, you can be a digital humanitarian yourself. So is this a drone or is this not a drone? Now I'll let you decide. But when you start combining this new technology with crowdsourcing, I think you've seen you can do some amazing work, not only in the wildlife conservation and humanitarian space, but literally just got an email yesterday about a project we're going to start with, an with a, a team of archaeologists who are flying UAVs to protect uh, excavation sites. And they want to use micromappers as well. And the crowd I know is going to love this because I'm going to spend a lot of time myself. It's a lot of fun, and you can learn and do really meaningful work. So that's my story. You know, digital humanitarians have been referred to as digital Jedis um, by the United Nations. It's a term that I wholeheartedly agree with. Some of the most amazing people I've met. So I'm hoping you're asking yourselves, you know, how, do, how do I become a digital Jedi? And it's as easy as tracing uh, rhinos in Africa or looking for dugongs in the Arabian Gulf or even helping our Wapichana friends in, in Guyana and, and others around the world. So a lot more in my, my new book. Uh, UAVs is one small part. I look at social media and crowdsource verification. Next generation satellites have a huge uh, potential for humanitarian response. And I would venture as well uh, public health. And then what do you do if you're a digital humanitarian and you work in a conflict zone or in a country under repressive rule? Some of the most inspiring stories uh, that really led me to, to, to share this book and write this book um, uh, are, 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 are the heart for me of, of this book. It's one thing to do disaster response in a, in, a, in a permissive environment, but what do you do when you're in, in China or in Iran or in Russia? It becomes uh, a lot more complicated. So if you do read uh, the book, you'll find out 
why spam filters actually have a role to play in disaster response. What, um, you'll find out about the very first example of crowd espionage. Huge ethical issues here because many of the volunteers didn't even realize they were, they were spying. Uh, so I don't shy away from some of these really difficult challenges. You'll find out why Vladimir Putin was really pissed off by this picture. Um, and lastly, you'll find out why massive multiplayer online games may be the future in digital humanitarian action. Thank you very much.